Good evening, friends and family. Welcome to Last Day's Awakening. I'm Jimmy. That's not how my mother used to say it when she would call me in for having done something a little bit not so good. But that's my name. I'm glad you're here. We are here with now the phone shut off. I'm so tired of receiving scam calls. And I get them now. They just flood me. And I know it's the reason is because I, um, I crossed the Rubicon. Okay, the Rubicon of turning 65 years old. Evidently, the scammers believe that I am now among a group that has somewhat addled brains and that they can somehow scam those of us who are over 65. And that may be true for some, but, you know, Outside of uh, being half crazy, like I always have been, uh, I'm, I'm not addled brain. <laughs> and I'm glad you're not either. And you're here, we're here together, and we're here to be encouraged, aren't we? We're going to talk about the state of the world for just a few minutes. And y- you know it's pretty bad. You know it is bad and getting worse. And then we're going to talk about the encouragement that the Word of God gives us concerning the pre-tribulation rapture. Now, I wouldn't call them scams, but I'm getting so much that is denying the pre-tribulation rapture. And that's fine. People are going to believe what they're going to believe. I'm going to go by the Word of God, and we're going to talk about that. We're going to walk our way through some specific verses tonight. I know you have before, but I want you to be encouraged. Sometimes encouragement comes because we remind ourselves. We remind ourselves of the truth of the Word of God, right? 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 Yes, because we're in the Word of God, and our encouragement comes from the Lord himself through the Spirit of God living within us, the Word of God that he has given us, that works its way into us for the purpose of purpose of making us like Christ and also causing us to long for Christ. It encourages us that Jesus will soon appear for us. But first, the state of the world. Of course, the elephant in the room that I'm not even going to talk about very much at all is what took place on Saturday evening. Or was it Friday evening, July 13th? And uh, I got such a kick out of uh, our friend Spinebreaker. Kevin, you, you sent me that note, and uh, it just made me smile because on the day count that he, he was looking at, the calendar that he was looking at, that was the seventh day of Tammuz, which is the fourth month, seventh day. And he equated that with being 47th president. Because basically, if we make it through to the election in November, whatever day that is, if we make it that far without having a rapture or a sudden destruction event, and I'm not trying to cause fear, if we make it that far, um, what took place on July 13th, probably won the nomination for Donald Trump. I'm not going to go beyond that other than the fact that we are seeing things that are just so bizarre and so wild and so crazy. The world is in great trouble. And we knew it would be, and we have seen it dive deeper, dig deeper into trouble. And can I say it this way? It's, you know, it's not even good grammar, but it's really true. You ain't seen nothing yet. You ain't seen nothing yet. The state of the world is such that everyone across the board, no matter who, is seeing World War III. It's either already begun, beginning on October 7th, with the Hamas attack upon Israel, or they see it coming and the whole world going up in flames in this World War III. One of the results of this attempted assassination of Donald Trump, and he, 
quite literally, he was millimeters from having the side of his head blown up. And that, I, when I watched it, and I watched it just minutes after it took place, and I watched the videos of his movements, and he quite literally moved his head and turned his head in just the right manner at just the right time for that bullet to miss his skull and take out his right ear. At least, you know, hit. He said he lost a quarter of that ear. You can call that an act of God. Well, I don't believe in coincidence. You know, the Lord is at work in all of this. Do I say that believing that Trump is the man of the hour? Because, and I'm not going to go that, I'm not going to go there. I'm not going to go. Some of you are going to believe that, and that's fine. I'm, I'm not going to interfere with how you feel about the MAGA movement or anything else. I'm going to say this. The resulting chatter from many places in the world from leaders in the world went something like this. Marine Le Pen in France, who was just basically cheated out of winning the election as president of France by a really dirty tactic by Man Manuel, Emmanuel Macron, Emmanuel said it this way, Donald Trump is the only man who can bring peace to the world. Another quote that I saw was that Donald Trump is the only man who can save the world. Did you hear me? Did you hear me? I'm not giving a for or against Donald Trump. That's not what I'm doing. I'm not saying, oh my goodness. You know, we're going to have a choice between, <laughs> uh, pardon, pardon the pun here, two weevils. And we're going to choose the lesser of the two weevils. I mean, that's, that's our choice at this point. If we make it through to November. Again, not a political commentary. I'm not telling you how you should vote in any way, shape, or form, or if you should vote. That's not what I'm doing. What I'm saying is the world is in terrible, terrible shape, and yet it's crying out. It's crying out for a man of peace. It is crying out for a man to save the world. It no longer believes in God. It no longer believes, or did it ever believe. It, it, it doesn't accept that Jesus is that man of peace. It doesn't accept that Jesus is the only one who shed his blood for the sins of mankind, and is the Savior of the world. He is coming back, and he will. He will bring judgment to the nations, and he will set up a kingdom, and it will be a thousand-year kingdom of peace. But they don't see that. They're looking for the man right now. They're looking for a man right now, believing that this man is the only one who can save the world. Now, some are automatically going to fall into, this is all commentary, right? This is... This is my opinion, so <laughs> take it for whatever you think it's worth. I, I think it's worth something or I wouldn't be saying it. I don't believe Donald Trump is the Antichrist. I just did a two-week study on Gog of Magog and, and how, the in my mind, uh, the likelihood is that Gog is a representation of a son of Reuben and will be the Assyrian, the son of perdition, coming from the people of the prince who is to come, you know, the, the people who destroyed the sanctuary as a complete typology of Antiochus Epiphanius the Fourth or Antiochus the Fourth Epiphanes. He named himself Epiphanes. And that the man of sin that is coming will come from the same area, from the same empire, which is an empire dominated by the spirit of Babylon. Again, go see Brother Tyler's videos. Generation 2434 on Babylon. Babylon the Great. And how America falls in, into line with today's spirit of Babylon. The spirit of Babylon upon America. It is Babylon the Great. I don't have to go back and work on that and prove it in any way, shape, or form because he did a tremendous job of doing it. Okay, just go watch that. What we're seeing is a precursor to this one who is to come. We're seeing, somebody asked me, uh, couple days ago, Rick, my friend Rick, he said, 
Could could he be the John the Baptist figure? The precursor to the one who is to come. Yes, he could be. I don't know. I don't know. All I know is the world is in turmoil and chaos, and it's calling out for peace. It's calling out for a savior. And that is where we are. Now, currently, we are in the midst of the, you know, after this attempt took place, we're in the midst of the Republican National Convention. And I don't know if anyone, uh, any of you are watching it. Or I'm not. I'm, I'm watching excerpts from it. But I want to show you something because the state of the world also includes the state of uh, even the parties, the two parties, the were two-party system basically in the United States of America. And it, it was uh, previously that the Republican Party at least was a representative party of the ideals of the Judeo-Christian ethic. But this year's Republican National Convention, of course, the convention, the Republican National Committee has a what's called a platform. These, this is the basis upon which this party is running. It is uh, the formation of the policies that it will pursue and the uh, ideology of what is behind that platform, okay? And this I'm going to show you is what I see as a pendulum reset or the baseline of the pendulum has changed. Now see the pendulum swings. We have a pendulum from deeply conservative to, to deeply radicalized liberalism, anything goes kind of a thing. It used to be that the baseline on the Judeo-Christian ethic side had certain planks in the platform that we could stand by, but those planks have been, pardon me, removed. Here's my pendulum. This is, this is the new baseline. The new baseline, this platform has removed the pro-life, you could call it anti-abortion plank. It's been removed. Abortion is not even mentioned in the platform. It's not an issue. In other words, they are going for both pro-life and pro-choice voters. So the pro-life platform has been removed. And, of course, much of the argument that has been taking place or, you know, the um, debate upon Twitter or in Twitter amongst ex-users has been this debate as to how can we stand with a platform that does not include a stance against abortion. And nobody has budged on it. It's gone. It's gone. That's number one. Number two, the sanctity of marriage plank has been removed. It's not even mentioned. What do I mean by sanctity of marriage? The sanctity of marriage within the Republican Party up until this platform was that marriage is between one man and one woman. And yet that has been slowly changing since uh, Donald Trump was elected president the, the first time around in 2016. When he did not take a stance, strong stance against gay marriage. And so that that platform started having squeaky nails way back then. We just we just weren't paying much attention because we were in this Cyrus effect. He's Cyrus, he's gonna bring peace to Israel. He's the God's anointed. Okay. Every every leader that rises up is appointed by God. He's the one that raises them up and takes them down. So we have to be really careful about calling someone God's anointed. But people bought into <clears throat> bought into the Trump syndrome, the Trump Cyrus syndrome way back then. Do I hope that he had a life-changing come to Jesus moment after July 13th? I surely hope so. I surely hope he took the step to really, truly believe on the Lord Jesus Christ as his Savior. Some say he already has, but see, the I'm dubious, and, and I really want to see that the man has come to Jesus. I really do, and, and proclaims it, and proclaims, I was a sinner, but now I'm not because I've been saved by the blood of Jesus. Something like that even in a rudimentary form, okay? Back to the pendulum. The LGBTQ plus acceptance is within 
this platform. In other words, they are attempting to have the big tent movement, which is an acceptance of the community, the LGBTQ plus community. They, they, <laughs> what we're seeing is that uh, we're not going to take a strong stance against uh, aberrant lifestyles. What that does is change the baseline for the pendulum. Okay, what used to be a pendulum that had a baseline of a of a Judeo Christian ethic has now, uh, if if I could write it this way, this this pendulum used to be clear up here, right? It has now moved to a new baseline. The only way it can go is this way, and unless something would happen as far as a revival in America where, <laughs> where America repents and comes back to the Lord and, and with droves of people who come to Jesus. That's the only way this can happen. This will not go back. It will not go back to a new baseline, especially if our only and last hope, I keep hearing this, is Trump. This is Trump's platform right here. And by the way, his daughter-in-law is the chair person. I'm going to still put chairman of the RNC. So it can only go this way. What am I saying? What I'm saying is the baseline has moved. The foundations have changed. Something has taken place. We see this. And the scripture tells us that if, if we find that the foundations change, then we've got, we've got a problem. Here's what Psalm 11, verses 3 and 4 says. If, let me blow it up. Just to, Can I blow it up just a little? No, I can't. If, there it is, right here. If the foundations are destroyed, What can the righteous do? This is it. If the foundations are destroyed, so even into the uh, the micro level of a foundation of a party in the United States, if if that conservative foundation is being pulled up by the planks, the foundation is being destroyed. What can the righteous do? Well, here's what the righteous do. Remember, the Lord is in his holy temple. The Lord's throne is in heaven. His eyes behold and his eyelids test. His eyelids test the sons of men. What do the righteous do? When the foundations are destroyed, we don't change. We still depend on and trust in the king of kings. We still depend on the one who is seated on the throne, and our eyes should be locked on him because he's the one whose eyelids test the sons of men. And the testing is coming. The testing is coming upon the earth. The hour of testing and trial is coming upon the earth. We're in the we're in the early stages, I believe, of that testing. What is our encouragement? What is our encouragement? That's what I want to go to right now. That's what I want to study right now. And this is this should be the encouragement to us. Not to, uh, once again, not to go into a modified stationary panic or curl up, curl up in the fetal position or get too rah-rah over the fact that Trump is going to win. No, our eyes, and I know this is true of you. I know this is true of you. I know. I know. I just know. I know you, I think. I can't wait to meet you in the air. But if your eyes are locked on Jesus like I believe your eyes are, then right now you are being flooded with a temptation by the enemy to despair. But by the Holy Spirit, you are being flooded with encouragement to look up and find rest in how you're looking at the one who is seated on the throne. 
we look up. And here's why we look up. We look up because of the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. This is what Titus chapter 2, verses 11 through 14 says, and I love this. For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. That's Jesus. He came, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present age, looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our Lord, pardon me, our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself his own special people, zealous for good work. So there, there's something that happened when Jesus came. When Jesus came, he, he brought the change. He brought the salvation. He shed his own blood. He rose again from the dead. He brought new life. With that new life comes the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. With the indwelling of the Holy Spirit comes the walk of sanctification where he is redeeming our souls unto himself. Our spirit is redeemed. Our souls are being redeemed. Our everyday life is in this walk of sanctification. We are we're being, we're being uh, uh, rebuked by the Word of God, taught by the Word of God, and brought into truth through the Word of God so that we are in a change. We are, in effect, being changed daily, and the Lord is purifying for himself his own special people who are zealous for good works. And we are. We should be zealous for good works. It's not works that bought our salvation, but our salvation opens the door to good works. That's how we should be looking at it. And this is our encouragement, that we look for the blessed hope, the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. It's blessed hope. The appearing of the Lord Jesus Christ is our blessed hope. The appearing of the, of the Lord Jesus Christ to the world, when he appears to the world, is going to be their greatest nightmare because he's coming on a white horse, a sword proceeding from his mouth, he will destroy the nations. He will set it right. That's when he comes back, and the world will see him. But the appearing to the church, the appearing to the church is not an appearing to the world. Will there be, where the, will there be something that causes the world to know that something happened? Quite possibly. Quite possibly, and we'll get to that by the end of this video, but they're not going to see Jesus. We're going to meet him in the air. They're not going to see Jesus. He's not coming at that point. Okay? So we are called to encourage one another. Here's a key verse. All right? This is a key verse for us. And, and we're talking encouragement. Let me get that back down here where you can actually see. We're called to encourage one another. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord. This is the Apostle Paul speaking. The Lord appeared to him and taught him this. This was a mystery. This is not what takes place in Matthew chapter 24. That's not a mystery. That, that gathering, that rapture-looking event in Matthew chapter 24 happens at the end of the tribulation. And, and many people who believe in a post-trib rapture fall on that verse. That's not a mystery verse. That was clearly given. The Lord said this is clearly taught. But the mystery had been revealed to Paul well after Jesus' death, resurrection, and ascension. And the Lord himself revealed the mystery, and this mystery is for the church. It's for the body of Christ. It was not revealed before. It's hinted at, as all mysteries are hinted at through Scripture, but it was hidden. So this is the mystery, and it's revealed that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. Coming. You can't, you can't hook your wagon here to the second coming. It just means it's parousia. He's going to show up. For who? For us. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God. The dead in Christ will rise first, then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up, parpazzo, raptured, together with them in the clouds, to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. Okay, pre the pre-tribulation rapture is, is the most comforting. 
It's the only comfort that you can get from a rapture, from a rapture theology, is a pre-tribulation rapture. Does that mean we don't go through tribulations? No, we go through tribulations. We go through trials. We've gone through some severe trials in our lives. And there might be more. And we may see more trials and tribulations. And the probability is no matter when Jesus comes for the church, we're going to see more trials and tribulations unless he comes in the next five minutes, which I'm looking up. (laughs) I'm looking up. But if we're talking a new wine rapture, we're we're still weeks out from the new wine, the festival of the wine. If we're talking about a a feast of trumpets, Yom Teruah rapture, or a Day of Atonement rapture, or a Tabernacles rapture, I mean, we're all the way out into October at that point. But still, there's time. If there's time, then there's possibilities of tribulations. Okay, so that's not what we're we're looking at. We are not discouraged by trials and tribulations. We we yoke ourselves with the Lord because His burden is easy, right? His yoke is easy and his burden is light. We, we find rest for our souls constantly, even in trial and tribulation, and effort that has to be expended walking through those trials and tribulations, and we rest in the Lord. So that's part and parcel with the Christian walk, including martyrdom, including dying for Christ. It's been there since Jesus himself went to the cross. Stephen was martyred. The apostles were martyred. Paul was martyred. Martyr, martyr, martyr. Today, people are being martyred, okay? So martyrdom is always there. It always has been. Would we give our lives for Jesus? Yes, we could possibly be martyred for him. I'm not trying to discourage you. Our hope is still in Christ Jesus. The fact is, the dead in Christ are going to rise first, and we who are alive and remain will be harpazoed. I know that's not a Greek term with the D on it, harpazoed. I just put it in a past, future, past tense, imperfect tense that hasn't happened yet. But we will be caught up we will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. So shall we ever be with the Lord. And what does it say? Therefore, encourage or comfort one another with these words. That's the comfort. The comfort is we're not going to go through the tribulation. Wrath is coming. How encouraging is that? Oh, oh, God's wrath. I'm not trying to make fun too much. God's wrath is coming upon the world. It is. It's going to come upon the whole world. But this is the promise that is given. Revelation chapter 3, verse 10, because you have kept, this is to Philadelphia, one of the only, one of two churches that received only commendation and did not receive the rebuke and the call to repentance. These two churches received commendation, and they're a picture of, of, of uh, the church in any age that stands strong. But this one is particularly uh, a picture of the church that stands strong, and many will call it the remnant church, the church that is staying true to the word of God until the end, as opposed to a Laodicea or a, a, a Thyatira or a Pergamum. He says, because you have kept my command to persevere. Hmm. I will also keep you from the hour of trial, which shall come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. So let's look at some wording here. The word keep. This is, uh, this is from right here. I'll, I'll highlight this word as well. And, um, and here we go. That highlight right there. Keep. It is the word Tereo, which means to guard, to watch, and by implication, to withhold or preserve from. Okay? So we're entering into harvest season right now um, uh, from our garden, okay? Uh, right now, the, the uh, cucumbers have been way too big. We've had so much rain, the sun's hit them, and they've grown so quickly that they went well beyond the pickle stage. So uh, my wife is very hopeful as we go out to the garden. It's going to. We had a bit another big rain yesterday. It dries out a little bit. There will be pickle-sized cucumbers, and hopefully they won't have grown beyond the pickle-sized cucumbers. I know you can pickle them if they're that big, but she does, she likes them a little bit smaller, and she'll pickle some cucumbers. And then we're going to can eventually some green beans because the green beans are delayed because of all the rain. But there's so many. Oh, 
we're gonna have so we're gonna have green beans coming out the ears we're gonna have so many green beans and tomatoes oh my goodness the wet hum, hot humid weather the tomatoes are going nuts we're gonna can them we're gonna preserve them we are gonna keep them from rotting we're gonna keep them and set them aside we're gonna move them out of the garden put them in a jar in a special location and set them aside right i just harvested honey what did i do i took the honey from the hive i didn't get stung i took the honey from my hives and i put them i harvested them i extracted the honey from the hive and i put them in a bucket i put the honey in a bucket and now it's set aside it's in a different location where the bees are no longer involved i have separated the the honey from the bees do you follow this principle is throughout the idea of harvest <sighs> how exciting and hopefully your garden's doing the same thing to keep to withhold or to preserve from okay that's the first word who you sue that's a greek term sue to keep you Tereo su ek ora. Okay, su is a personal pronoun. It's in the second person singular. So who is he speaking to? Let's go back up here because you, you is the church. You, the church of Philadelphia. Ah, you. So it is a second person singular. I will keep you. So it's not an individual, but it is made up of individuals. I will keep you, the church that has come that has kept the word of my perseverance, my command to persevere. Wow. I will keep you from ek. Ek. The word ek is from, as in out of place, time, or cause. It is out from among. It means to keep you from. So place, time, or cause, meaning you're going to be separated from that place or from that time or from that cause or that moment or that event. And the event is explained. You're going to be preserved out from among. You are going, the church, the faithful church of Jesus Christ, the body of Christ is going to be removed. I'm excited. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm not yelling at you. I'm, I'm, I'm just excited about this. You'll be kept from among. You're not going to go through the wrath of God. We're going to see that in just a moment. From what? The hour. That's the term aura. It's the same word in Spanish. Spanish is a Latin-based language anyway. Okay. Toreo su ecora. Time period, season, hour, day, or instant. Of what? Of trial. The perasmos. It's a putting to the trial. It's a putting to the test. It's a putting to the proof. To try. By implication means bringing proof, proof of wickedness, proof of evil, proof of rebellion. Here's a little note I attached. The seal, trumpet, thunder, and vile judgments. And we don't know what the thunder judgments are, okay? We don't know what those seven thunders are. John was uh, uh, to eat that book, okay? It was uh, tasted sweet, but it was bitter in his stomach. So don't know what those are, but the sealed trumpet, thunder, and vile judgments are poured out with the opportunity of repentance. And it says they did not repent. They would not repent. With no repentance comes the witness of the righteous judgments. Now, the example, and I'm preaching through the Exodus right now to, uh, to Freedom Church. Pharaoh was immersed in the ten plagues. Each time he refused to repent, his heart was hardened more. And so thereby, with each plague that God poured out upon Egypt, God hardened Pharaoh's heart. But God's judgment was based on the fact that he knew, read it again, chapter 4, he told Moses, but I know that Pharaoh will not listen to you even by acts of my mighty hand. Hmm. God's judgments and trials form the witness against Pharaoh that will be brought to his trial in the last day. Okay, so Pharaoh is going to rise, <laughs> rise not to life, but he's going to rise to judgment, and then he will be judged. 
as just as everyone else, but he will have those 10 judgments stand against him. So each judgment is a witness. It becomes a witness, first of all, to the righteous judgments of God. So the seven-year tribulation with the seal judgments open, with the trumpet judgments open, with whatever the thunders are, with the vile judgments that are opened, and the other judgments that are interspersed through them with the releasing of this angel and the releasing of these demons and the releasing of the guy from the bottomless pit, etc., etc. Each of these form witnesses against mankind. God always gives the opportunity until the final judgment, till the final judgment, or till death, he gives the opportunity for repentance. But with each hardening of the heart comes a greater witness to the evil and the wickedness of mankind. So once again, the idea is not to harden your heart. When you hear of the good news that Jesus took the wrath of God upon himself for us, it should soften our hearts. I mean, that good news should cause us to go, and it did for me, I know it did for you, should make me say, I believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. I receive that gift. I receive the gift. And he makes us sons of God. He makes us, he adopts us into the body of Christ. But for many, it is a an odor, aroma that brings death. And Paul, Paul recites that in uh, 2 Corinthians. He says, it's for the, for the uh, aroma to some is life, but to others it is death. And so it becomes a witness or a testimony of the actual sinfulness of the person. Do you follow? The seven-year tribulation, and it is seven years. It is one week of years. It is a Shemitah period of time corresponding to Jacob's trouble. But we know the day count of this tribulation period from the start to the end. We know the day count. Seven years of bringing trial, tribulation, judgment against mankind with each succeeding judgment, if you look at it in a linear fashion or if you look at it in an overlapping fashion, it doesn't matter. Each succeeding judgment judgment or set of judgments brings a witness against mankind. And the only opportunity, even during that time, will be to repent. To repent and turn to God. And it will be an actual turning to God. And the people who do it during that time will lose their life. This is the scripture. What does this say? I will keep you from that putting to the proof, that trying by implication to bring proof, that proof of wickedness, evil, and rebellion, the pouring out of the wrath of God upon the world. He will not pour it out on us. How do we know? Who are those that are judged by God's wrath? The earth dwellers. It's the, it's the earth dwellers. Who are we? Who are we? We're already seated. Boy, you could go to all kinds of scripture. We're already seated in Christ in heavenly places. He's the head. We're the body. The head's coming back for the body. And we will be seated physically, new glorified bodies, the whole church, in heavenly places. Right now, it is, <laughs> it is bought and paid for. So the head is there. Our hearts are there. Our redemption is there. We're seated with him in heavenly places. Hallelujah. But I haven't seen it yet. You haven't either because I don't, I need a new body for that to take place. I need a new body because this mortal, this corruptible cannot see that. So we need a new body. Huh. We are not earth. Well, we're sojourners. We're foreigners. We're strangers. But our citizenship is in heaven. We are citizens of heaven. And so citizens of heaven are not judged by God's wrath. Do you hear that? Does, does that encourage you? Uh, let me take a quick poll here. Raise your hand. Give a thumbs up. <laughs> Whatever you need to do, give a thumbs up right now. If you're a citizen of heaven and you're encouraged by the fact that God's wrath is poured out on the earth dwellers and you're not an earth dweller, 
and you won't be on the earth as an earth dweller when this happens. And I'll show you that. All right. Are you encouraged? Put a thumbs up, thumbs up or a hallelujah or something. Romans 5, 9, what's wrath? Okay, much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved. Say that, saved from wrath through him. Okay, so we've been justified by his blood, a good way, of course, to understand justification. It means it's just as if we had never sinned. We, we, we've been made new. The past is gone. The old is gone. Everything is brand new, and I, I think it stays brand new. I think it's Every day we, we experience the brand new. It doesn't mean we're saved over and over again. It's just, it's just as if we had never sinned because of his blood, the propitiation, the covering of his blood, the atonement that took place for us. So we are saved. That's the word sozo. It comes from saos, which means safe from, delivered from, protected from, or preserved from. There it is again, preserved from, kept from protected from what god's wrath now in in that first verse that we looked for we were we were able to see that was the hour of trial that is coming upon the whole world we will be preserved from remember the preserves up on the shelf we're out of the picture the honey's in the bucket it's not in the hive anymore will be the honey in the bucket. We will be seated physically. Well, 24 elders, picture of the church, be seated physically in heaven, ready to throw ourselves down and throw our crowns down at, at the drop of a hat, the, the shout of a hallelujah, <laughs> the holy, holy. We're going to throw them down and be in total and complete, wonderful worship of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, the Lamb who was slain from before the foundation of the earth. Back to our screen. So, so-so, delivered from, protected from, preserved from, wrath. Here's the word, orge. And orge means vengeance, indignation, wrath, anger, violent passion from justifiable abhorrence. So, once again, the wrath, the wrath of God proceeds from the righteousness of God and the justifiable abhorrence of God against the sin of mankind. And the sin of mankind is going is and will go deeper into the abhorrent. So that's the wrath of God. Guys, we don't participate in that. We do not participate in that. Republican National Committee, plank or not, we don't participate in that. We are not of that ilk any longer. And we were of that ilk in one way or another. We were sinners. But by the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, we have been saved by grace through faith. Praise God. And so we're no longer of that. That's why Paul says, such as many of you were, we were all sinners. And some were of the deep Okay, I have to be careful how I say that, but the aberrant behavior, witchcraft, homosexuality, death cults, all of that involved somewhere of that, and yet the Lord brought them out. Is that not exciting? Praise God. Praise God. So that's the word vengeance. Let's go to our vengeance. Uh, pardon me, wrath. Let's go to our next verse. 1 Thessalonians 1. 9 through 10. I love this. For they themselves declare concerning us what manner of entry we had to you, you being the church at Thessaloniki or Nica, however you want to say it. That's the church. So once again, it's a second person singular. And how you, second person singular, the church, Turn to God from idols. But the church, of course, is made up of individuals who were worshiping idols. You turn to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for his Son from heaven. Later on, verse uh, chapter 4, we're going to see how it happens. But here he's saying you're waiting for his Son from heaven. What, what is our blessed hope again? The blessed hope is the waiting 
how should I say this? The, our blessed hope is the appearing, which comes at the end of waiting. Blessed hope is the appearance. We won't be waiting anymore. The waiting will be over. Okay, so he <laughs> he had he, how you turn to God from idols, serve the living God, even Jesus who delivers. Okay, so soto above was a word that means deliverance, but this is a, a different word, ruomai, and uh, it more corresponds to the term natsal in the Old Testament. Natsal is a term that means um, delivered from the fowler's snare. Um, it's very similar to yatsa, which means to be drawn out of the water in Psalm 18, etc., etc., etc. So it means to draw out, to deliver, or to rescue. So who does that? Even Jesus, who draws us out, delivers us, and rescues us from. Okay, from here is a different word <laughs> than tereo. Uh, no, tereo is keep. Pardon me. Ek. It's apo. Apo. It means away from in, in place, time, or relation. Denotes separation, departure, cessation, completion, or reversal. So it means lots of things, but what it basically means here within the context is to be delivered in place, time, and relation to what's going on. What's going on? The wrath. The wrath. The tense here is uh, an imperfect tense, meaning the wrath to come. It hasn't come yet. It hasn't come yet. But when it does come, we're not going to be here. Why? Because we will have been drawn out, delivered. Romai, Old Testament, Natsal, Yatsa. We will be gone, rescued, away from, brought out of place, time, and relation to the wrath that is to come. Huh, what's wrath? Same word. Orge, vengeance, indignation, wrath, anger, violent passion for justifiable, justifiable abhorrence. To come. Erkomai. So we have apoa orge erkomai, which means uh, uh, the imperfect tense. And uh, I, I give a little ex explanation here. I have come is the perfect tense of the word erkomai. I have come. So come is used uh, in the past tense. He was going to come. So it's a past tense. He finally came, right? But it also means I will come, that which was to come and presently is, or that which is to come and has not yet happened. And this is in the imperfect future tense. So what's the verse again? In the present future tense, it hasn't happened yet. Even Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. Someone look at this verse and say, well, we've been delivered from God's wrath. Well, that wrath hasn't come yet. Yes, God's wrath is... is Revealed against sin, we know this to be true. That's why Jesus came. But the wrath, the, the hour of trial, the, the, this wrath poured out for a seven-year tribulation, including the seals, all of it. You don't think the Antichrist being released on the earth is God's wrath? You don't think the, uh, the, 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 the black horse where, where you've got... Uh, Peace removed from the earth? You don't think that's God's wrath? Good night. Peace will be removed. Death will reign. That's God's wrath. Huh. A little excited here, aren't I? Next verse. First Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 8 through 11. But let us, who are of the day, be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and as a helmet, the hope of salvation. For God did not read my lips did not appoint us <laughs> to wrath but to obtain salvation through our lord jesus christ who died for us that whether we wake or sleep we are r should be there i don't know why r isn't there but whether we are awake or asleep we should live together with him, therefore comfort, ooh, comfort each other and edify one another. So 
Are we comforted just for the fact that whether we are awake or as- we're asleep, we're with him? Or are we comforted by that and the fact that we are not appointed unto God's wrath? And I believe this verse is speaking about God's wrath, to comfort one another and edify one another just as you are also doing. Why? Because tithamai means we are not ordained or purposed or set forth or sunk down, appointed for God's wrath. Us, again, first person plural, us. Okay, Paul is talking about all who are believers in Jesus Christ, who are part of salvation through Jesus Christ. We're not appointed. Ace, indicating the point reached or entered place, time, or purpose, unto, meaning that point of wrath, when it's poured out, we are not appointed to it. Oh, there's that wrath again. (laughs) It's there again. It sounds terrible. It is terrible. It's going to be horrible. God's wrath is going to be poured out. The whole world will be affected. Every bit of it will be affected. We are not appointed to it. So what's holding back the wrath? Because we're seeing we're seeing the world in upheaval and turmoil, aren't we? Yeah. What's holding it back? We've studied this before, but let's take a little slant to it from a different direction just for a second. What is holding back God's wrath? What is holding back the revelation of this tribulation, the start of this tribulation, and the revelation of the figure who is to come, the Antichrist, this, I believe, Gog figure, this son of perdition. Well, the presence of that which he promised to remove or deliver or or rescue from the wrath. So the, the presence that is here is the church, the body of Christ, it's still here. Second Thessalonians 2, 1 through 15. Got to read the whole thing. Now, brethren, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, Perusia is the word there, and our gathering together to him, okay, we ask you not to be soon shaken in mind or troubled either by spirit or by word or by letter as if from us as though the day of Christ had come. So, The tribulation hadn't come, even though some had written a letter saying it's already come. Let no one deceive you by any means, for that day will not come unless the falling away comes first. So the day of Christ, that's the day that Jesus comes back. Up here, there are two distinct differences. The coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, number one, and our gathering to him is another event. He's going to explain that in just a moment. And he's already explained it in 1 Thessalonians. Let no one deceive you. That day will not come unless the falling away comes first. That's that's a term, uh, apostasia. I believe, uh, I mean, the evidence is there. It means departure. It's the word that means departure. So there will be a departure. And many interpret this as a departure from the faith and apostasy. And it could be actually both, but it seems to denote a physical Departure, I'm not going to argue this right now, but the apostasia happens first, and the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he sits as God in the temple of God. Now, we know this hasn't happened yet because there is no temple of God yet, showing himself that he is God. Do you not remember... I don't know what happened. I just did a blink there. Do you not remember that I, uh, that when I was still with you, I told you these things? And now you know what is restraining, that he may be revealed in his own time. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. And then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. Coming of the lawless one is in accordance with the working of Satan, with all power, signs, and lying wonders, and with all unrighteous deception among those who perish because they did not receive the love of the truth, that they might be saved. And for this reason, God will send them strong delusion that they should believe the lie, that they all may be condemned. There's there's the wrath, okay? All be condemned who did not believe the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. 
But we are bound to give thanks to God always for you, brethren, beloved by the Lord, because God from the beginning chose you for salvation through sanctification by the Spirit and belief in the truth to which he called you by our gospel for the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, brethren, stand fast and hold the traditions which you were taught, whether by word or epistle. So something is restraining. What is restraining? Well, I think it's quite easy to understand what is restraining. Some would say, well, the Holy Spirit is restraining. Yes. Some would say, well, the church is restraining. Yes. How can they be both? What entity is the temple of the Holy Spirit? The body of Christ. Who's the head? Jesus, who's the body? We are the corporate we. The we. The church. Not the church that claims to be the church, but the true church of the Lord Jesus Christ, the gathering of the Lord Jesus Christ, the gathering of the body of believers, the body of Christ. Those who believe that Jesus died for their sins and rose again from the dead and have received the gift of his grace, received him. So the individual, upon believing on the Lord Jesus Christ, receiving the gift, is filled with the Holy Spirit. We're indwelt by the Holy Spirit, but corporately the church is the dwelling place of the Holy Spirit. (sighs) So yes, it's the Holy Spirit that's restraining, and it's he is a he, by the way, not a life force, he. Bible says he in most places. Jesus says he, the other comforter, will come. He, the Holy Spirit, the restrainer, is restraining through the church. Why? Because he, he, he lives within the body of Christ, the temple of the Holy Spirit, and us individually, the temple of the Holy Spirit. We being a body made up of all the building blocks being put together as a holy temple, dwelling place of the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. Okay, so we're still here. As long as we're here, this son of perdition cannot be revealed. He cannot come into place. While we're still here, the beast, the beast who controls the beast cannot rise. What is holding back the beast? A harlot is riding the beast. Once again, I send you back to the studies. On this channel, on other channels, and on Tyler's, Brother Tyler's channel, Generation 2434, the great studies on Babylon the Great and the city, the great city Babylon. And see that Babylon the whore is riding the beast. The beast cannot rise to be its own authority until the one that is riding in authority over the beast, holding it down, keeping it restrained, keeping it in place, is removed. And that's Babylon the Great. Yes, I do believe that it is America. And I believe the spirit of Babylon is controlling America, just as it has in each of the empires, in the entire statue, in the dream of Nebuchadnezzar, from the head all the way to the toes. The spirit of Babylon Mystery Babylon is throughout. Okay, so what's the precursor event to to this? Wow, we know that the rapture will happen and we will be taken out of the way. So the restrainer, the Spirit of God indwelling the church, the indwelt church, will be gone, restrainer removed. But could it be simultaneous with or right at the same time as the harlot being destroyed? And I believe the answer is yes. And here's the, here's the reason why. The precursor to the event, or the precursor event to the rising of the beast. Here it is. After these things, I saw another angel, pardon me, about to sneeze, coming down from heaven, having great authority, and the earth was illuminated with his glory. And he cried mightily with a loud voice, saying, Babylon, the great is fallen. Okay, this fall doesn't mean destruction yet. This fall means it has fallen into the depth 
of the spirit of Babylon. It is in the depth of evil. Okay, it's fallen. It's fallen. It has become a dwelling place of demons, a prison for every foul spirit, and a cage for every unclean and hated bird. It's all demonic reference. For all the nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. The kings of the earth have committed fornication with her, and the merchants of the earth have become rich through the abundance of her luxury. Now, both chapter 17 and chapter 18 expound upon what those luxuries are, what the fornications are, what the pharmacia is, the deception of the whole world, the city, the the lady standing, you know, in the harbor, the the whole picture of uh, of demonic fallenness is upon the United States upon New York City, the central location, the seat of empire. Yes, Washington, D.C. is the place where government happens, but the controlling seat of the world of this spirit of Babylon is obviously New York City. Some would say New York City's power is waning. It's still the power. It's still the seat of the world, you know, the, the United Nations of the world. And uh, it, it's, it's, it's all right there, including go watch... Tyler's videos, oh my goodness. Libertas in the harbor and who she represents. But look, here is the call. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, come out of her, my people, lest you share in her sins and lest you receive her plagues. What are her plagues? Judgment, wrath, destruction. For her sins have reached to heaven, and God has remembered her iniquities. Wow. Do you you get this? God, (laughs) his eyelids are judging, trying men, okay? His eyelids are are, uh, judgments prepared. Babylon has to be destroyed for the beast to to rise to its power. The harlot has to be gone. The beast itself does it. The beast to rise has to destroy its rider. The beast, when it rises, will absorb the spirit of Babylon, the mystery Babylon, this abhorrent, spirit of Babylon that has been there since the head, Babylon, and Nebuchadnezzar, the the, the head, will be there all the way down through the ten toes. But she's, the harlot right now is the personification of mystery Babylon, and that mystery Babylon has to be destroyed. Then the spirit of Babylon will pass to the beast. The beast will rise, and then one will rise in the midst of the beast. A little horn, one king, will rise up devour three horns or overcome three kings and take control of the beast. And all of the spirit of Babylon will be personified in this one character, this Antichrist. Evil, complete and utter evil. He will declare himself to be God. What's holding him back? We are. We are. Why are we to encourage one another with these words? We're still here. We should be encouraged because we won't be here. <laughs> okay? It's, 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 it's fully connected, right? Our head is seated at the right hand of the Father, ever making intercession for us. He's our propitiation, perpetual propitiation, atonement. He is our covering. He's coming back for his body. Now, many times we say bride. Understand that the allusion to the bride is is actually the occupants of the New Jerusalem. That that's our 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 that's the bride that is adorned. But we're the occupants of the bride. Okay, just as each of us make up the body of Christ, we're one body. Just as each of us make up the occupants of the city, New Jerusalem. The city of New Jerusalem is the bride. Therefore, we are the bride. Just an explanation to those of you who keep saying, the ones of the Bible say we're the bride. No, it's the same connection. Head, body. Head, body. 
the head of the city. <laughs> it's God. The bride is the city. Who are the occupants of the city? We are. We're the bride. You see it. Encourage one another because the bride's not going to be here for the wrath. The wrath is coming. It's already swirling. It's boiling. It's bubbling. It, God's wrath is rising up in his face. And it's, he's, guys, he's going to explode, but he, he's a controlled wrath. He's righteous in every way. And that wrath will give testimony to the world and give opportunity for repentance until it can't. It will end up being the testimony for the destruction that will take place at Armageddon, for the judgment of the nations, and the entrance into the millennial kingdom. That's, that's what we're coming up to. For that to all be released, the first event has to be. Whether simultaneously or very close together, it has to be, number one, the removal of the church, delivered from, rescued out of, away from, place, time, and purpose of the wrath of God that will be poured out on the world. We are not appointed unto wrath, but to obtain salvation through Jesus Christ our Lord. Hallelujah. That should give you encouragement. That should make you comforted, even with everything that we're seeing. Yes, there's still deep concern in our heart for lost people and for loved ones. Yes, concern to the point it drives us to heartache and, and tears praying and hoping for our lost, unsaved loved ones and our friends and our neighbors and the world itself. Yes, why? Because the Holy Spirit is grieved. He's grieving for that. He, he came to reveal Jesus through us. But it should not take away our hope, and it should not drive us to despair, and it should cause us to be encouraged and comforted to persevere even in the atmosphere of these days. Can I get a witness? Can I get an amen? Not because I need one, but we need to amen this. This is why the truth of the pre-tribulation rapture is the only one that can comfort and give joy and provide any hope whatsoever. Whether you're going to believe it or not, it's not up to me. I've given you my case, and I will certainly get people in comments who will tear it apart. That's fine. As far as I'm concerned, it cannot be torn apart. In the meantime, we hold on. We stand fast. We stand firm, as Ephesians chapter 6 says. We stand. Having done all, stand. And we remember that we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. Why do I come to that verse every time? Because we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. Philippians 4.13, we can stand through these days. We can maintain joy through these days. We can be looking up through these days. We will not be caught off guard. We see it coming. Our heart is there. Our hope is there. We've already got one foot in heaven. We are ready for that trumpet sound. We're going to stand fast and be about the Father's business until it happens. When it happens, we're out of here. And with that, I say, I'm out of here. Love you all. God bless you.